I am here at the Guinness Storehouse to meet up with Constance Harris, fashion editor at the Sunday Independent and one of the biggest reference in the fashion industry in Ireland. I can't wait to see what she's going to tell me. So Constance, I am so thrilled to have the honor and the privilege to interview you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to work with you, Sophia. <laughs> no, really, I'm really, really excited because I know that you are one of the main references in the fashion industry in Ireland. So who are you exactly? Can you tell me a bit about yourself? Well, I'm the fashion editor of the Sunday Independent and Life magazine and I've been working for the Independent for about 20 years now. I started off as a stylist and then in the late 90s I moved into writing and then um, into editing. Okay. And, and one of the great things was that we launched a magazine uh, about eight, ten years ago, I actually can't remember when, and, uh, but that then changed everything. We became so much more fashion orientated after that. Okay, so you were a fashion stylist before starting I, yes. as a fashion editor. Yes. So is it right to say that a fashion editor is first and foremost a stylist? No, every, st every fashion editor comes from a different background. Um, I, a lot of them, some work up through the ranks like I did as stylist to fashion editor. Some straight away go into to writing and then become editors. Because the publications and magazines and newspapers are about so many different aspects, people can come from different areas. Okay, so what is the job of a fashion editor exactly? Because it seems very complex. You have to have a lot of knowledge on a lot of different areas. So what do you do? Well, the, the, the thing about fashion is, is that it's limitless. I mean, it's absolutely everything in our lives, from the cup of coffee we drink, to the clothes, to the houses, to everything. So it's without boundaries. So you could spend every single second of your life studying fashion. Okay. And that's something that people don't really understand, that you, do, you go on holidays and you're instantly looking at what people are wearing. You want to check out the shops to see how they buy, because everything is information. But what you do as an editor is you refine it. You decide, OK, it's a huge subject. Like focus, let's come in to the microcosm again, let's not take from the huge to the small and then you grow that again. So if you think about a trend and we decide that we like tribal and it might be just because of a bead on a bag that yes. then grows into a thing about print that grows into a whole new identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what an editor does. Okay. So just like a designer actually in some ways. Yes, yeah, so have you ever found yourself in the street looking around and thinking, oh my god, what is she wearing or what is he wearing? I would, I would do a makeover with that person. Yeah. Um, I'd say you're probably more inclined that way, Sylvia. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, I, I see you itching to get your hands on people. Um, do you know, at this stage in my life, I, no, I don't criticise what people wear in terms of fashion. It's more the fact that because I see fashion as, a, as an expression of life force and how people engage with life, okay. that when I see people dressing badly, it's more that I get sad because I think that they're not engaging with the joy of life, that they're not happy. Okay. And that's what I see in their clothes. All right. yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's an interesting point of view. Like how to make the most out of who they are, their personality and their body shape using clothes and styles and different uh, material and fabrics and all that. Well, fashion is all about the now. It's always been about showing off that you're absolutely up to the minute and on top of the world. I mean, fashion is a statement of power, but not in terms of like power abuse. It's more a statement of I am very powerful in myself. And if you are not, you're, you will reflect that in your clothes. So, so you, the reason why fashion is embraced by young people is that they're, they're at the height of their That's force true. in life, yes. you know, and why older people tend to wear very pale colours mm -hmm. is that they're kind of letting go of the force, yes. which is why I love to see elderly people, senior citizens wearing vibrant colours, dyeing their hair matte colours, even even the, 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 you know, what we call the Blue Rinse Brigade, because they're showing that they're engaged with life and they're still interested, and that is the beauty of fashion. Mm -hmm. Then fashion becomes about your tribe, who, who, you know, what's your social economic group, what music do you listen to, if you come, and then it's about your country, you know, its attitudes to sexuality, you know, and then it goes on of what part of the world are you part of, you know, you're part of the information technology, you know, you know, do you dress grungy or do you dress, you know, uh, I can't remember the word my son uses now, but you know, these, it, it expands all the time. Yes, so it's, it's wild, it's a very it's wild huge. environment and it's cultural, it's everything in there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when you looked into the mirror, first thing this morning, what were the first things you thought? 
hair was I saw bags under the eyes. Seriously? <laughs> yes, I did, I did. Well, I was aware I was going to come meeting you and I was going, Jesus, I didn't need bags under the no, eyes this morning. I don't see them, I can't see them. Yeah, it's good concealer. So, yeah, I, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you don't just uh, wake up looking beautiful and fabulous. Of course not. You need concealer. No, 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 I need concealer. I <laughs> so what are your beauty secrets? What's, what do you use? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that I only started wearing makeup quite recently. Okay. Much too. Everybody's disgust. I just, and this is part of kind of like the whole thing about how we engage in life. I didn't, I, I was lucky, I was blessed with good skin and strong looks. I didn't really need that much makeup. Okay. But now that I'm older, I'm seeing the benefits of it. All <laughs> so, right. And um, one of the best things, I mean, I could, if I could advise anybody, this is a brilliant thing to do. Book a makeup lesson okay. with a makeup company that knows about makeup. So whether it's MAC or Makeup Forever. But I went to my friend Nicole Lynch, who used to be a model. 20 years ago, we started out, me stylist, she models. She's now a makeup artist for MAC. I booked a session with her and I said, show me how to do a makeup routine that I can do myself mm. and she taught me how to do my eyes and um, it used to take me 40 minutes and now it takes me eight minutes wow you know so it's, okay. I've got it down to that <laughs> and I have a perfect little kit and she taught me that I have to travel nowhere without bright dark brown eyeshadow and mm -hmm. um, she taught me little tricks to brighten the eyes and uh, and I have to say oh and lip pencils I've discovered that to wear lipstick you have to have a lip pencil yes that's, that's yes, true yes definitely. so I, I feel a bit retarded at this point because <laughs> I'm in my 40s and I'm discovering stuff that you know kids at 12 no, you know, but still, it's it's been actually I have to say it's been a joy for me to discover makeup at mm -hmm. this stage of my life, rather than be, you know, down pat yeah. to to it for years and years and years. So, do you feel more beautiful since? You yeah, I realised that I'm enhancing what I had, okay. which I never saw that relationship before. You know, I mean, I think I was a bit of a hippie. I grew up in the <laughs> 70s. Like, that's when my childhood was. Everybody was throwing, you know, they weren't wearing bras, they weren't wearing clothes, they weren't wearing makeup, you know. <laughs> Dark room or bright room? Oh, always a bright room. Always. Um, I, because I think because, uh, like a lot of people, I get depressed and okay. darkness does uh, fill that and I have learned to how you cope with depression is to fill it with light Lights, you know yes. absolutely it's essential and anybody who, who gets depressed should look at their light bulbs and look at their light fixtures and um, I was I love Sweden I went to Sweden for the first time about five years ago and it's one of my favorite countries now and I've been to it in the depth of winter and what I love is they always have beautiful lamps okay. and they have red like you're wearing Cynthia but people always say oh red is the color about sex and I'm saying no it's mm -hmm. not it's about life force it's about the blood that pulses through our veins and how we embrace life. That's what red is about. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, definitely. so I wear coral red a lot. It's lovely yes. to wear it today. We've been clashing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 What were you doing at midnight last night? What was I doing last night? I think at I was. Midnight. At midnight, I was asleep, Cynthia. Yeah, I go to bed Are you early. serious? Yes, I go to sleep early. I do. What do you mean you went to sleep? I don't know. So, no crazy rock and roll party lifestyle for you? No, no, it's been kind of too long. No, I have to say, if there's a really good party, I will go. Okay. But, um, but I don't waste time. You know, if, if there's, I, I, I do um, think that I study Ayurveda a lot, the Indian system of health, mm -hmm. and they believe you should follow the rhythms of life and you should go to bed early and get up early. And I know I work more efficiently when I follow that and I'm much more happy and I'm much more stable. But um, inevitably in our job, there's a lot of late nights. So I'm at that stage in my life where I can say I am prioritizing a little bit my private life over uh, social life. Yeah, because for me it was like fashion, you know, industry. I would think party, party every night, sex, drug and rock and roll. Yeah. So that's not what's happening in, in your life. <laughs> no, not in my life. But again, this is Ireland. And, you know, you were asking before about is fashion ruthless in yes. Ireland compared to abroad? And it, it's not. It's not. It's not at all. We're, okay. we're, we're a small little pond and we're very respectful to each other. We fish, you know, we swim around each other. You, you know. seem to be a very spiritual person. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's come like everything else, the journey through life. And, you know, you have challenges and how you cope with them. And um, definitely having a, a, um, a belief in the bigger picture and in compassion for fellow man and being supportive of fellow man has definitely made me a lot happier okay. um, and you know part of it came about from how I learned to write for the newspaper because when I was doing two columns a week for the newspaper on fashion and repeating some of the subjects like the designers because we, the whole ethos of the Sunday Independent is to support the Irish design sector the Irish retail sector so of course I'd be writing about someone I might have written about a year before okay. and I had to find well where have they changed where have they evolved and that also kind of met me in terms of my heart and and all that and it's become really beautiful to actually be consciously engaging with analyzing the country Irish women mm -hmm. how they have changed in the last 15 years and they have changed magnificently I, I'm full of admiration <laughs> so for how, how, did, how have Irish women changed in the course of your career 
Actually, Irish women changed in 1995 with the great heat wave. We had six months of hot weather in yes. 1995. Okay. And up to then, Irish women never showed off the bra straps, you know, were covered up to the neck wow. and down to the okay. ankles, you know, didn't buy sun wardrobes. We didn't have, you know, this, all this travel abroad. But within two to three months, they had tans, they were getting their hair highlighted much more often, they were dressing more flamboyantly. Okay. And they, I remember Dunn stores launched really colourful bras and gel straps, and all these things came in. They were about showing off. And for the first time ever, Irish women engaged with themselves as, as flesh beings, you know, as, as beautiful, as sensual creatures. And that was the start of Irish women being liberated. That you was know. a revolution. It was a revolution. Oh, wow. And it actually happened to men as well, because Irish guys up to then were horrendous kind of patterned jumpers and okay. jeans and, you know, baggy jeans, and they didn't engage their, their handsomeness at all. And in that same year, Hawaiian shirts came in in cargo shorts. Okay. And Irish guys started to wear, wow. now, you know, men, they go into uniforms, right? Yes. But that was the uniform. <laughs> so there was Irish women tanned, genuinely tanned sundresses, guys wearing Bermuda shorts. And, you know, I th you know the country started getting it on, basically. That and sounds amazing. We started to get more liberated, you know? That's amazing. And then by the late, the, the, with fashion, boho came in and it was very colourful and flamboyant. And again, black was the largest selling colour in this country. Yeah. And women thought about their work wardrobes all the time. But with boho and with kind of the liberation that happened with this great summer's weather, they started to dress more flamboyantly. And they, st they stopped wearing suits at best race days and they started wearing you know, more f moving clothes, sexier clothes, and then Sex and City came in. Oh, wow, and that, okay. And then there was this explosion. All right. And that just happened with the Celtic Tiger. Young designers started meeting, a glammy lifestyle came in, and women started to dress for each other, really dress for each other rather than from work and rather than for their okay. husbands. And there was this huge change, you know. And what has happened now at the end of the Celtic Tiger is that Irish women are really saying, we don't want to let go of everything we've got, okay? But we have to be a bit more sensible now. So they're refining, they're editing themselves at the moment, and they're being much more uh, cohesive and constructive, you know. And Irish men are, are you know, they didn't move quite as fast, but, you know, they, we're hoping to catch up. But having said that, um, no, the Sex and City thing really did pass me by. Really? Yeah. Well, oh. I have to say I didn't like Sex and City. I felt there were four men dressed up as women. Seriously? Yeah, I did. Oh I didn't. God. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Okay. So, right. you know, maybe okay. there's something wrong so with me. So do you me. think it was too much? Do you think it was like a kind of exaggeration of yes. women, basically? Y yes, I didn't like the portrayal of women. I, I think women have a hard enough time in this modern world having having kind of sacrificed so much of their femininity to be equal to men okay. and, and becoming so masculinized. And I think the journey for women now is to come back to being women again yeah. in such a way that men can feel comfortable mm -hmm. and um, you know and that men can take back their position mm -hmm. as the males mm -hmm. and um, that I felt Sex and City was very much about women dominating everything That's true, and actually. being masculine and hunters and I don't think you know somebody said to me oh you're being old-fashioned I'm kind of going yeah I can understand why you think it's old-fashioned I don't think it is because I like being a woman and like uh, part of the joy of the makeup thing is actually I'm dressing much more feminine now in recent years as I've, I've kind of stopped being the hunter-gatherer of my family and started to enjoy being a woman and I hope that journey is ahead of everybody else and I found it quite interesting you know one of my favorite designers is Prada okay and it's actually not so much for what she does with her clothes but for what she says about fashion all the time okay. and she thinks about fashion and women as, as I do in that she is thinking forward and um, with her autumn winter collection she said um, and it's a collection that people don't really understand they're not sure if they like very much um, but she said she was going back to beauty and she was going back she was pulling away from all this hard edge thing and and that's really what fashion was about fashion is about beauty it's about the feminine it's about celebrating uh, and celebrating the beauty of men and um, and our engagement with life now and that's what Prada sees you know okay. and it was interesting Prada about seven years ago turned around one year when everything was very flamboyant and sex and the city and the whole world was interested in clothes that weren't real clothes by the way I mean the, yes there were fabulous fantasy things yeah. and they're very impressive but there wasn't beautiful tailoring going on there wasn't construction and shape and uh, you know lifestyle going on and Prada turned around and said I want to put form back on the body I want to put shape and discipline and she foresaw the economic crash she foresaw the need for structure in her lives and she started to give all that and then just as the rest of the world caught up with her she's then turned around and said okay I've had enough of that now I actually want to now get back to the real truth of fashion okay. which is beauty and womanhood